I got up and made my breakfast, and I heard Martin Scorsese's Hugo wins 11 nominees, and I shrieked out loud because it was so lovely to to uh, that many uh, is, is amazing, and it's the most we've ever gotten. And also, the great thing about it is that we have such a lovely crew that works all the time with Marty. Um, mm-hmm. and we're very dear friends. It's like a big family. So that means that every member of the family almost was recognized, and that was really lovely, except for the actors but uh, and makeup, I think. <laughs> but to have all of the people that I work so closely with, um, uh, you know, be recognized, it's, it's really lovely. Well, I, I would think that the, the recognition for this film is particularly special because it is about the love of film and passing that on to a new generation. I mean, it's very meaningful. Absolutely, and we were quite stunned at how wonderfully children reacted to it. It's not just a children's film. I mean, one of the things we're trying to make clear now is that it's very much for everybody. Mm -hmm. I think some people didn't go see it because they thought it was just a children's film, but it's not. It's much, much more than that, and... um, Everybody enjoys it. So, but we we were rather f- afraid at first that when we first showed it to children, um, that they would be throwing popcorn and texting each other, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it was pretty scary. And they were just riveted to the screen. It was wonderful to see. I mean, I Scorsese and I sit in the back of the audience because we talk to each other all during screenings because we're still editing and making changes and we say, oh, let's drop that, let's tighten that. Um, And uh, just looking forward at the kids, nobody was moving. I mean, it was unbelievable. And then afterwards in the cards that they write and tell us what they think, they just kept saying how much they love the silent movie clips Mm. and um, the movie making, and uh, they gave us incredibly high numbers, much higher than the adults, actually, which were very high also, but these were, like, you know, 95% excellent, and that was such a joy to think that the film was impacting them and reaching them. I I think it's very important to try and, you, you know, not to dumb down, obviously, and actually try and stretch the audience and this was mm-hmm. what was happening with these kids it was wonderful to see but it's also a distillation of all that Scorsese has done over the years to rescue the reputations of the masters who went before him and uh, how he brought Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger's films back to the world and brought mm-hmm. Michael back to the world and um, had done so for so many directors and so many films like the Egyptian film Al Momia, which he uh, restored. It's really a distillation of that, I think, this movie. So because we love film history so much, you're right that it was a particularly joyous film to work on. Absolutely. It, and you're right. I mean, the, the film definitely encompasses all of that. And I was I, I was talking to Robert Richardson uh, last month uh, uh, about, oh, about Hugo. Uh, and uh, we talked about much of the same thing in, in that... When I was watching it, I was thinking about Mr. Scorsese when he grew up and and the movies that he watched that led him to want to become a filmmaker. And I was thinking maybe maybe someone of the new generation coming up will be watching Hugo and and they will be inspired in that same way. Oh, Uh, gosh, I hope so. I hope you're right. That would be wonderful. uh, So It's such a beautiful kind of thing. But also, I mean, so many of, of Scorsese's films are about movie love uh i mean this one explicitly uh so do do you kind of uh find yourself immersing yourself in whatever kind of genre or or world or particular filmmaker he's he's kind of paying homage to in some of these projects yes i mean it's all there's always been something different for each film by the way but there's always been uh something that is uh sort of an inspiration for, mm-hmm. for the movie we're making. And, um, uh, for example, in Gangs of New York, you may have read this, uh, Marty wanted the opening fight sequence um, uh, in the snow uh, to be cut like Eisenstein's uh, uh, junk in, in, in a certain way. Uh, there's a sailor who breaks a dish. He's washing a dish. Uh, on board the ship um, after the crew has been fed food that's crawling with maggots 
mm. and they're furious about it and ready to revolt and he sees on the dish uh, give us this day our daily bread and he smashes the dish and Marty said look at the way that's cut he, he didn't use the downward arm movement Eisenstein instead he used the up arm movement he fractured everything so that the way the shots are used is almost like a plate fracturing Mm. And it was a brilliant little moment, and he said, that's how I would like us to cut the battle sequence. And so we did. They, we, we we tried to use um, uh, things sometimes you wouldn't put in a film, like the blood on the snow underneath their feet, right. uh, instead of actually somebody hitting somebody. There's a lot of people being hit, but um, and, and fractured it all, and changed the speed of it. And um, that was all deeply influenced by Eisenstein for example, just that one battle scene. Um, and so there's there's uh, always something in each film. He shows the crew movies before we start shooting, and um, that so that they're imbued also with that inspiration. Mm-hmm. And, of course, there were many films to look at for this one. So And many little secret, little secret homages uh, that are sprinkled throughout, actually, to films. Um which is really lovely. Is it a difficult process? Uh, because I know that you've also sh- uh, you've also edited uh, uh, movies about the uh, uh, documentaries with the, Mr. Scorsese about the history of, I believe, American oh, yes. movies and the Br- British it's cinema. Out. I think you're. Well, we're doing, doing the British now. We haven't finished it, but the Italian cinema was a, a particularly joyous one to work on. Uh, mm. Those films, of course, of the neorealist films of Rossellini and the men who followed him, Fellini and Antonioni, uh, they, they were, De Sica, they were enormous influences on Marty when he was a young child. You just mm-hmm. cannot overemphasize how enormous those influences were. And it was a great joy to work on them and find a way to edit the clips so that the audience was hopefully feeling for the film the way they would if they saw the whole thing. And uh, what a powerful period of filmmaking, my yeah. Lord. I mean, it just <laughs> burst out of Italy like uh, a thunderbolt. I don't know. I mean, it must have been the conflict of fascism and communism uh, under which they were living as Mussolini was in power and the uh, desire to protest against it and not be able to it must have been the crucible in which this great work was was formed and then the war of course just solidified that and these masterpiece after masterpiece came out of that period so it was absolutely such, such a joy to work on i can't tell you well but when you when you edit uh when you kind of pull highlights and different scenes and things from other people's work uh such as Melies for hugo is that a daunting process yeah, well, it was very hard. It's always hard um, because our original edits on those montages of clips were like four times longer, you know, because <laughs> there are so many incredible things that Melies did and uh, that amazing sequence where he's throwing his head up into the music staff. Mm-hmm. That I would have loved to put the whole the whole film in because it's so brilliant uh, and even our visual effects person couldn't figure out how the hell he did it until he really studied it but uh, yes it, it was very hard to cut down and remove things that we loved and it, it is when we do the documentaries too of course we would like to make them 15 hours long <laughs> <laughs> well particularly my, with husband, the ver- my husband's films are very hard to clip because that's what I was going to ask yeah yeah, because films that he made with Emmerich Pressburg, or his great partner, were so complicated and subtle, and they're not um, they're not easy to uh, convey to someone who hasn't sat through the whole film because they are so masterful. I, uh, mm-hmm. I mean, Scorsese's films, in a way, are that way too. Uh, if you have a filmmaker who's a little more cut and dried, um, it's much easier to pull a clip. Uh, than it is from a film that is deeply uh, felt and thought out and resonating throughout with very uh, real truths about human beings. Mm-hmm. Uh, because, you, you know, they they don't have cliches in them. Cliches are very easy to clip. 
<laughs> but since there are no villains in Marty's movies or in in uh, certainly not in the films Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger made, there's never a villain. It's always in the gray area of human behavior, never the black and white. You know, mm-hmm. Michael never saw life like that. He didn't. He, he always saw the complexities of human beings, and so. There's never a villain, and there really is never a villain in in Marty's movies either. Right, I agree. And, and you know, you guys have worked together for so long, and um, I've been curious with an ongoing collaboration like that. It is was the, has there ever been a time when you've had difficulty connecting emotionally to a piece of material? Oh, no, never. <laughs> I mean, one of the great things about working for Marty is that each film is different, and it has, mm-hmm. it's a different challenge, and we all get to go over the hurdle with him. And so, no, never, ever. I mean, uh, there's always such powerful emotion in his movies that um, I've never had that problem. No, I mean, the problem is that sometimes I'm weeping when I'm looking at the daily. Yeah. Uh, for example, the not only, of course, the crucifixion in... Last Temptation, but the um, in Hugo, of course, the end scene where mm-hmm. uh, he thanks the boy in the gala was I was weeping during dailies and while I was cutting it, and then the end of Shutter Island, interestingly, when uh, Leo's character decides to have a lobotomy was terribly moving, the way Marty did it on the steps of that building where at first you can't quite figure out what's going on and neither can the Mark Ruffalo character who's the doctor, who's the psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. Because Leo is telling him what he thinks, what he thinks Mark wants him to, what, you know, he, he's, um, he knows that Mark is expecting some sort of behavior from him. And so at first he's sort of feeding him that behavior and then he very mysteriously shifts into something else and it was so beautifully directed and acted. It took a while to get to the right moment, but, oh, it's just heartbreaking. So I never have a problem with Mark. <laughs> never. <laughs> well, it, it, it's interesting because, I mean, you've expressed a couple of instances of, of kind of deep emotional connection to, mm-hmm. to the material, and yet your job as an editor would also require you to have kind of a, uh, I don't want to use the word cold, but a, a, a more kind of oh, distant, yeah. observant eye. Is that a difficult balance sometimes? Yeah. I mean, it, 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 you're quite right. That is what Scorsese relies on me for, and, and that I can look at it with a little more perspective and distance than he who has been dreaming it up, coming up with a conception for the entire movie, uh, a conception for the camera work, a conception for the editing, for the music, uh, for the acting, and he's been then co-writing the script and then directing it, and he sometimes feels he just gets so close and buried in it that he needs a colder eye uh, to to look at it from outside. So I read the script once, and then I don't read it again unless there's some restructuring or something that we have to do, and I may have to look at it. But I try and let the film evolve before my eyes in dailies, when I'm looking at them alone before I look at them with Marty every night, I just prefer to see how the film is evolving, not not from what I remember from the script, but what is actually there, what he's captured, uh, right. and then work with that. And, and it's true that there are some times when I can see something he can't see because he's so close to it, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, and sometimes I have to say, well, we're going to have to drop that, unfortunately. Um because in all filmmaking, one of your jobs is to cut the film down, <laughs> and it's always very painful, and sometimes we have to lose Marty's favorite scene or my favorite scene. That happened in After Hours and um, in order to make the film work. So it is part of our job, though, to have that uh, unfortunate scalpel waiting <laughs> to... Yeah. Cut something. Yeah, it's, it's very hard. But it is amazing, and it's something that obviously audiences aren't privy to because they're not in the cutting room. They don't know what they're missing. But when you when you find that you cut frames or or a minute or seconds from a movie, and it changes the tone or the pace of the whole thing, it, it's it's very mysterious. Is there an element of mystery that remains for you? 
it's it's amazing to us sometimes what happens when we cut something down or rearrange it uh, and then screen it, because that's what we do. We screen about 12 times. Most people don't, but we still are able to insist on that because that's how we make our movies. We We screen it. I debrief people afterwards. And when we start with a smaller group and then bigger and bigger until we get to two or three hundred, at which point we have to give them cards. I couldn't possibly debrief them all. But um, it's amazing what you learn from audiences. Things that you thought were working aren't at all, or they don't understand Mm. something, or uh, they think something isn't funny that you hoped they would think was funny. So you have to keep going back and reworking and reworking. And as you do that, it's, it's very mysterious how... Uh, things evolve and even we sometimes will try something and then screen it and go my gosh that made that character emerge which we didn't expect you know uh it, it, it's quite interesting but you would have to sit here for six months and i make a thousand decisions a day it would be so boring but <laughs> <laughs> but um I, I wish there was some way that i could sort of show people one day i will i'll, I'll show all 12 cuts you know and show yeah, what happened yeah. in between so they can maybe get some. I never get time to put that together, but uh, I do have to at some point. It's well, important. I, I think so, too. I, but you guys do such bold, uh, risky... There's, there's a sense of experimentation going on a lot in, in some of these films. And it, it, with the editors that I've spoken to in the past, um, I mean, they, they refer to editing as the invisible art. <laughs> but... I mean, I'm very aware of the cutting in Scorsese's movies, but they further my investment in the film emotionally. Ooh, that's a very beautiful way of putting it. Um, Yes, he is a great editor. Editing has always been his passion, and it's his favorite part of filmmaking. And his early films show, his student films even show, incredible bold editing. Uh, And that has always been... Um, his predilection. Uh, that's why Eisenstein is so important to him. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he he and I really would sometimes like to slap the audience in the face <laughs> instead of being <laughs> invisible, you know. Yeah. And uh, it's funny because sometimes I've been criticized by my peers. Uh, at one point, somebody said to me, "Why did you do that jump cut in Goodfellas?" And my answer to him was, "Which one? I mean, there were so many." <laughs> Yeah. We were dealing with uh, particularly one character who runs the nightclub, and uh, he was a person that Marty had seen on at 2 a.m. in the morning on some very strange local show, and he said, oh, that guy is brilliant, I want to have him in the film, but he was not a trained actor. So when he was improvising with Paul Savino, he wasn't sometimes uh, aware of what a, a professional actor would know to do at times and so sometimes I had to make some awkward cuts but the improvisation was so brilliant who cares you know Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but some people um, object to that and if you go back through the history of film you will find mismatches and bad jump cuts all over the place uh, so it's it's the least thing for people to be concerned about, as far as I'm concerned. We we usually, you know, they used to do this thing where they would write up how many jump cuts we had done, or how many mm. bad cuts they they think uh, that we had done in films like Goodfellas, and there were 300 or something. I don't know. Please, it's ridiculous. <laughs> you have to do what's right for the movie, even if. Well, that's it. it. That's it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, absolutely, and and I would think that the the, the style of cutting a kundun is much different from cutting a good a good yeah. fellas. I mean, the requirements Age are of innocence. It was, it yeah. was the same. Yes, I mean, we had to slow down when we did Age of Innocence. Of course, kundun was a great joy to work on because we fell in love with the Tibetan people who were there. You know, four hundred of them, and uh, became very much part of the cause, of course, and uh, of trying to get them freedom from China. But um, they were so lovely, and they they weren't actors, and they mm. were wonderful because it was their story they were telling. And they felt so deeply about it that they were unbelievably good. I mean, uh, we were just stunned at how good they were. And uh, that was a joy to work on 
you know, because it was coming just out of their being. It was yeah. in their souls, and uh, it was just heaven to work on and to remain friends with them for the rest of my life. Um, and it was, Marty did ask me to study something there. He asked me to uh, look at the book of how sand mandalas are made, beautiful idea of the monks spending two weeks creating these beautiful sand mandalas uh, with colored sand and funnels. That's it. And uh, they make these beautiful things, and then after two weeks, um, it's washed away into the river. A very beautiful Buddhist idea. And so Marty said, I, I want to shoot a section of the San Mandela to open the movie, and I need to know what is important. You know, what does that God mean, and what does this mean? And so I got to go watch the monks do one, and it was just heaven, and then learn about it, read the book, and that that kind of thing goes on a lot in our movies. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm I wanted to ask you about one film in particular because it's it's the Scorsese film that I go to most often. I watch it at least twice a year, and, and that's that's Casino. Oh. Uh, I've always adored Casino, and I think about the the accomplishment of that movie, and there were so many balls that you had to. To, to kind of balance up in the air because you had multiple narrations, multiple character arcs and storylines, and, and and a very a kind of an epic canvas, but told in a very intimate way. Uh, tell, tell me about that experience of putting that together. Yeah, that was that was a very hard movie to to cut uh, because of, as you say, because of the narration, and and I. Uh, we reworked and reworked and reworked the narration in the beginning because I just felt it wasn't explaining clearly enough what was going on, how the mafia was controlling the casinos. And, and Marty was a bit reluctant at first because he, you know, my husband Michael Powell said to us, never explain. <laughs> Which is mm -hmm. which is a very good thing to try and do if you can in movies, but sometimes you have to, and uh, so we just kept rewriting and rewriting and re-recording. Um, you know the actors doing that. Uh, it was very very hard to get it exactly right, and it could be a little bit sprawling that movie because of the nature of it. Mm -hmm. uh, and the the wonderful thing that's happened in your actually. Um, making that clear is that it when it came out it was very badly received you know it, this isn't oh it's not good fellows people said no it's not good fellows it's about las vegas it's something entirely <laughs> different so it has to be different we can't keep making good fellows over and over again as much as everyone wants us to they always say to us couldn't you make the last 20 minutes of the film like the last 20 minutes of good fellows and we say well you know, uh, the Dalai Lama is not on coke. <laughs> and <laughs> it's, it's a little different, the situation here. <laughs> He's fleeing for his life into India, and it's a tragic moment for him, and we can't uh, cut it the way we cut that insane last 20 minutes, which was a joy to cut, by the way. And again, we were using very dramatic jump cuts in there, uh, a lot to uh, for a purpose to convey the fact that Henry Hill is bombed out of his mind, and um, and that so the film should make you feel like that a bit mm -hmm. that everything is disconnected. And so, anyway, um, Casino was a different situation, and but now everybody is, you know, talking more and more about that film, particularly young people, which is great. I mean, it, it, it's such a victory. Uh, our films often take ten years to be recognized. And they're often, you know, excoriated when they come out. <laughs> and then ten years later, like Raging Bull, that happened with that. And, uh, and Casino. So I'm glad you feel that way. It, it's, it's got incredible stuff in it, doesn't it? I mean, it does. And it's one of those movies, I mean, it feels like you've gone through such a, such a full experience. But a lot of movies that, that you see nowadays kind of bombard your senses. And they exhaust you when you walk out of it. But, but this one made, may, always makes me feel kind of elevated and more alert. I mean, it just fires off my brain in a very special yeah. way. Oh, that's great. Yeah, I, I, I we're so happy to see this happening. Uh, um, the only one of our films that it hasn't happened to is Bringing Out the Dead, which is very interesting. Mm. I don't know why. Um, 
but because it's about compassion and it was actually advertised as a car chase movie, <laughs> which yeah. was a little bit off the mark, <laughs> uh, um, and it didn't do well at all. It's too bad because the it came out of Kundun in a way, you know, uh, because that's the one word that the Dalai Lama uses all the time is compassion, compassion, compassion. Yeah. And that's what's going on with Nicolas Cage as an ambulance driver in that movie. Uh, anyway, maybe one day it will. <laughs> I I think it's bound to happen. I, I mean, I and I, I look at Bringing Out the Dead and I look at the other kind of New York-centric films you guys have done together. And there's such vivid, different portraits of of life in that city. Uh, yeah, the difference between After Hours and Bringing Out the Dead, for example. Yeah, it's it, of course, Marty. There's no one who can lay the city down the way Marty can. Right. As yeah. hard as it is to shoot here, it's uh, it's in our blood, and um, you know the danger of living in the city is all part of it too. It's uh, such a rich environment, and um, it's nurtured us. Do, do you find that if you, if ever you look back? At some of these films, I know you've probably had some occasions to do so, but are, is your mind consumed with the choices behind the cuts so you're not able to kind of enjoy the film as an audience would? No. I mean, you mean if I looked at something like Casino Now, is that what you mean? Mm-hmm. No. I, I would be aware maybe of a couple of times when I would be uneasy about something I couldn't make work as well as I would like, um, but I... No, I, I, it impacts me. It, it's good actually not to see them for a long time because you do suddenly see them the way the audience does. That's, we try so hard to remember what we felt when we first saw a daily of something. Yeah. You know, you, I write it down even, uh, and we want to try and never lose that. But you tend to, as you're editing, you tend to lose to lose it. So it is great 10 years later to look at something and feel it like the audience does. I, I still notice things, you know, where I say, ooh, I wish I could have. <laughs> but right. not not too much. But um, but I know I do feel it. 